So I'm good. I guess good. we'll get it working. Okay, perfect. It's a little bit out here. Okay. Well, excellent. It's a pleasure to have the opportunity to visit with you. And I got to be perfectly honest. Um, when I was asked to come and present, uh, I said, "Sure, be happy to do it." And then I found out where I was positioned and who else was on the agenda. I'm between the guy that created Google Maps and a renowned expert in uh, sustainability, who I've heard speak millions and millions of times. And I, maybe not a million, Sarah, but a lot. Okay, I know how good she is. I thought to myself about an experience I had uh, when I uh, was a presenter at a American Feet Manufacturers Association meeting, and uh, they had a speaker come in that uh, speaks on a national stage, was phenomenal. Uh, did a just phenomenal job. I mean, I was just had goosebumps when the gentleman got done. And uh, I was sitting next to the person who invited me to speak. And uh, I looked over at him and he could see I was a little nervous. And uh, I said, do you have any, any, any advice? And he said, well, don't suck. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it was good advice. And so I'm going to try to do the same thing here. Uh, but in all honesty, I really believe that uh, uh, the stage has been very, very well set for hopefully the message and comments that I want to share with you. Um, as I got to thinking about why uh, is it that uh, me and, and this message that I have is relevant to, to this group, I think in all honesty, because it's certified ASB, I think we're trying to do a lot of the things that are trying to be accomplished through U.S. Caltrans. And what I mean by that, I think as we look at this, I want to give you a little bit of perspective in terms of what we do. Not everybody here might be familiar with what we do in Certified Angus Beef and, and how we're structured, but by sharing a little information, I think you might be able to see where there's some similarities in terms of organization structure and the approach that we do use to operate in as a brand and where that might fit to where the vision for U.S. Cattle Trace sits as well. Well, as a brand, we are a not-for-profit organization, very similar to U.S. Cattle Trace. Many of you may not know that, that we are structured that way as a not-for-profit. We are owned by the American Angus Association. We're as a grassroots organization as, uh, as there is uh, in the marketplace, owned by those who get up every morning to care for and take care of cattle, who wear boots to work and so forth, and we're governed by a board of producers just like U.S. Cattle Trace, and I think that's important. Oftentimes I get the question, well, how are you funded? We're actually funded by commissions that we garner from the packing community uh, for the opportunity to merchandise product under the Certified Angus Beef brand logo is our funding source. You know, oftentimes uh, also that uh, we get the question, well, so do you own the cattle? And from a, from a standpoint of organizational structure, all we own is a couple buildings in Worcester, Ohio. We own two or three minivans, four Taurus, and an Explorer that everybody loves to drive, okay? And we own this logo, this trademark. That's what we own. We don't own cattle. We don't own feed yards. We don't own facilities. We don't own box beef. We don't own packing plants. We really own none of the infrastructure that the industry has to produce product, to produce beef, but we own this logo. And so in essence, uh, you'll see on the screen there, uh, Airbnb, many of you are probably familiar with it, perhaps have used it. You know, one of the largest uh, hotel-like companies in the country doesn't own a single property, okay? Uber, anybody Uber here from the airport? Okay, Uber, the largest transportation service out there, doesn't own a single car. It's kind of like certified Angus speed. Okay, we function to create value, yet we own None of the infrastructure, and I think that too is familiar to where U.S. cattle trace is structured as well. We do that by partnering with people downstream, okay? We partner with 19,000 different uh, in, in entities across the world in 54 different countries to, to translate value through the supply chain, okay? Starting with the consumer. And in doing so, then we've been able to sell over a million pounds of product through that network and along the way, hopefully, create value, 
not just for the producers that own the program, but as we're going to talk about, create value for everybody who touches the product, who touches the brand. Okay. For there to be value, there's got to be value to the chef, there's got to be value to the distributor, to the grocer, okay, to the packer, to the feeder, to the cow calf producer, and then ultimately to the seed stock producer. And in doing so, we have been successful in creating economic incentives and, and value in the form of, uh, in, this, uh, in this data here, $92 million a year are paid from the packer back to the producer, just in that segment. And so it gives you some, I think, perspective in terms of where the brand, uh, how we function, how we operate, and hopefully gives you that perspective in terms of how it might be similar with where U.S. Cattle Trace is looking to create added value that ultimately drives the adoption of a disease traceability system. And so I think there's some similarities here, and I think that's why I'm on the program. Is that right, Callahan? That's right. Okay, so let's see. Now that I understand why I'm here, let's see if I have anything relevant to say, okay? <laughs> And it really comes back to creating this pull through demand. And that's, that's the basis of what we're talking about. Creating consumer pull through for what the system is producing or capable of producing. And the last speaker, Brian, did a phenomenal job of talking about what we could be capable of producing. I mean, that's, that's exciting. When you look at the future of what technology can bring, and the fact that there's opportunities to create value throughout the supply chain. And so then how do we create that demand and how do we economically align each segment to benefit from that? Now, one of the things I wanna share is, is as a brand, this is the brand promise that we work every day to deliver on. And as you can see that we deliver or promise to be the, the best tasting to continue to work to maintain that position, to be the best selling option that individuals have uh, in terms of the beef space, and then the last one there is to, to be the best sourced. And I share that not to just give you insight into our perspective as a brand, but I share that because I think the, the beef industry as a whole has a very similar set of promises. And I think if you look back on where we've been as an industry, the industry has done a phenomenal job on identifying where we can improve and identifying ways to make significant change in a meaningful way. For instance, just with regards to best tasting, go back to the 1991 National Beef Quality Audit, where we identified some issues as an industry. And as an industry, we created a better product, didn't we? Effectively created a better product, okay? If you don't believe it or don't know, look at where the percent prime choice is today. And we've made significant intentional shift in what we do as an industry, and intentional is important. And as a result of that revolution for quality, we're a much better selling product industry-wide than we have ever been as well. And I think that then takes us to where we're at today. And I put that best sourced one in there because that's where change is happening right now, okay? Best sourced in, in, in our world used to be, tell us the story of the farmer and the rancher, okay? make me feel better about that relationship. And it still is a big part of what we talk about and what is being asked for by downstream end users. But it's beginning to change, okay? And I think this area of source, this is the new quality revolution, okay? If we were to do a national beef quality audit focused on sourcing, we would identify areas today that, that we need to improve upon and that offer, I think, significant opportunities to connect more intentionally and intimately with consumers. And when I say source, I want to be very clear. I'm not talking about location, okay? That source is so much bigger than just the location of where that animal is sourced from. Okay, as we see it through our interaction with customers and consumers, it's now about not just where the animal was, but what was its experience, okay? What can you tell me about how the animal was treated? Okay, what can you tell me about the background of the people who handled that animal through there. And so sourced is so much bigger than just location. It's really about, you know, where it comes from, okay? The experience that it had, the environment it was in, and the people who impacted it. And that's really being driven by this changing consumer. And this is not new information. And I'm probably gonna share some stuff with you that reiterates what you already know. Uh, but if you're like me, you need to hear some things about three, four, five, my wife says six, seven, eight times, okay, before you really understand it and internalize it 
in a way where we begin to take action on it. Okay? And what we know is that the consumer is changing today. There's no doubt about that. Okay? Now, the best part is, is that eating meat is still the norm. But we began to see this growing separation or segmentation of consumers with probably the most notable one being the flexitarian. The flexitarian, if you're not familiar with it, you've probably heard that term already, but the flexitarian is an individual who leans towards plant-based diets, but is still willing to consume meat, consume beef. Okay, we also have this new one over there, the pescatarian, is that right? It's basically a vegetarian that will eat fish, okay? That's not me. Okay, Governor, I grew up in Kansas. We're a long way from fresh seafood. Okay, but uh, uh, as we talk about this flexitarian population, they're driving a lot of things. Okay, they're making beef purchasing decisions for different reasons. Now, overall, as it's the slide says there, quality and taste is still the biggest driver. Why beef eaters and meat eaters purchase that product. Okay, but we also know that as we see the needs and interests of consumers begin to broaden. We know that these other topics are beginning to come up. Animal welfare is a, is a point of decision-making that uh, consumers have. Health, the planet, okay, environmental sustainability and social responsibility. Those are all things that are driving the conversation today more than they ever had. And that creates us um, some uncomfort for us many times, but it also can create tremendous opportunity. And so when I was asked to do this, uh, and come up here and, and present to you. Uh, I took the opportunity to uh, to talk to, to Callahan, I talked to, to uh, Brandon, talked to a few others just to gain some perspective. And it was very clear to me what question I am here to address. And that is that what downstream needs of either the customer or consumer, or the ones that they have, can traceability be really paired with? Okay, what can be paired with to help cover the cost of implementation? to where we can create so much value that the cost of getting disease traceability is really a big point. That's really what we're trying to do. And so we try to do a certified Angus speed as well. Okay, so that's the question that I'm here to, uh, to try to address. Now, the best part about my conversation with Brandon was that he said, John, we really don't need you to provide a lot of answers. We really need questions, challenges. Well, if you don't need answers, I'm your guy, okay? <laughs> I'm your guy, so I, I was excited to be able to do it. And I was having a conversation with uh, Justin Sexton, um, and uh, uh, we started talking about some different things, and he shared some points that I thought were very, very important, that are important for, for this group to hear and internalize. And so the question I have for you, since I have that freedom to leave you with questions, not answers, is that what's being done at the ranch level, okay? To get more people interested in the cap, that you're producing, that you're raising. What are you doing? Is it just quality grade? Okay, is it just performance? Are you protecting our pairing areas? What are you doing for soil conservation? The things that Brian touched on that we can hopefully have technologies to help measure. But I think it's about looking at this thing a lot bigger than just traceability assigned to the animal. What does it tell me about the animal? And rather, as we look at traceability, what does it tell me about the farm as a whole, the producing community, the beef community as a whole, that can come along with that animal as it makes its way through the system. And I think it's just a bigger context. And this is something that Justin said, so I do want to give him credit uh, for it, because it's very, very important that, and, and we see this in our value-added efforts as well at Certified Angus Beef, that value-added pursuits, they do require a mental shift, okay? And I think this is, a, this is an important point. Okay, not every, not every point that I think is important does the audience always think it's important. So if I think it's important, I'll let you know, okay? But this is an important point, that it requires a mental shift from producing to producing into something, okay? Producing to a specific outcome, producing to a specific customer, producing to a specific market uh, is really extremely important. And so as we talk about adding value, where can value be added? I think uh, the, uh, the last speaker, Brian, did a phenomenal job, I think, of talking about it. And as it relates to disease traceability, it is extremely important that ultimately putting the system in place, the individual producer is going to have to find ways to add value to their operation, improve their management, things that elevate their profitability, 
when they put a system in place to help cover some of that cost. I mean, I think Brian spoke about that quite well with regards to what these types of technologies that can be a part of traceability can do to elevate management and productivity. Obviously then, what relevant and meaningful information can be passed on to the next person in the chain, to the feed yard, and to the stocker operator and so forth, all the way to the packer. And, and I, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about the value added opportunities that occur within the production sector. I think in all honesty, you're more equipped to have that conversation than I am. And I think in many cases, you've already had some of those discussions about how value could be created by moving information from one sector to another, to another, as long as that information is relevant and meaningful and can be acted upon in a, in a significant way. What I wanna share and spend my time talking about is really what about the rest of the chain? What do they need to know? Okay, what do they need to know that is beginning to become relevant to them in the world that they operate in? And, and I think that when you look at that, uh, just that green to red graph or, or bar there on the slide, now, this is not new information. That knowledge level varies greatly across the beef production and merchandising chain. Obviously, the rancher knows the most about ranching. Okay, the production sector truly understands what we do and why we do it in the process of producing beef. Yet as we go farther down uh, through the chain, clear to the consumer, that knowledge and understanding really diminishes. And I think it's acceptable, we understand that. We, we get why that's the case. But here's the dynamic that's taking place that is very, very uh, important. And that is while understanding is very, very low among consumers and end users, the interest in what you do has never been higher. They are more interested in what and why you do, what you do through the process of raising cattle than they have ever been. And that creates a dynamic that is very, very, very important. Okay, because the challenging part is, is we all know that we work in a very complex industry. And the more complex something is, okay, the harder it is to trust, okay, if we don't understand it. And when we don't understand something, what do we do today? Pick up our phone, and if we're not looking on where we want to go, we still go to Google, maybe not Google Maps, we go to Google, and we Google for information. That information may or may not be truthful, okay? I often get questions about, you know, what's changed significantly over the last several years uh, with regards to certified ASP. If we bring customers in, from around the world into our facility to educate and communicate with them about the dynamics going on in the marketplace and in the brand and in the production sector and so forth. And honestly, maybe it's subtle, but one of the biggest changes that I've seen is that when I started at Certified Angus Beef 20 some odd years ago, consumers, not so much consumers, customers would come to our facility with gaps in their knowledge base, identifiable gaps, okay? Today, when they come in, there's not a single gap, okay? What I mean by that is every possible space that they feel they need to understand what's going on is now full. And educating consumers and customers today is much harder because we have to establish trust with them to let, allow them to let us extract the wrong information and insert the information that we know to be factual. And that's an extremely important point because it changes the way that we look at transparency and information and its availability and how and the manner in which we share it. You know, I think it's fair to say we've all come through COVID <laughs> and anybody would ever agree that general, in general institutional trust is eroding. Okay, I think so. Okay, we don't trust our governments like we used to, our government officials. We don't even trust the medical community and we have questions. The media, we're long trusted. We don't trust as much as we used to, right? That's a joke, you can laugh, okay? <laughs> okay? But institutional trust is clearly eroding. And, you know, there's no doubt that we're gonna continue to probably see some of that. And in this country here in the US, that slide there, that data point at the bottom, would suggest that we're one of the most skeptical, okay? Uh, that's out there from, from our consuming public. And I, I love that quote. It says, to trust the other is to gamble upon their capability to act with integrity. And in the world of beef consumption and in the world that we're in, the other is us, okay? 
And whether we like it or not, today we operate in a world where I think it was Ronald Reagan that said, trust but verify. Okay, I think people want to trust. But they want factual information today to justify the trust that they place in others. And that presents an opportunity uh, for us. You know, so I guess from my perspective, what I would share is that as I think of traceability, and we all come at this from different perspectives, but as I come at this whole realm of traceability, it's by no means the end game. And I get the sense that everybody here agrees with that too. That's why we're having the conversation we are today. You know, traceability is nothing more than the vehicle to get to trust. And trust is, is uh, really something that's focused on transparency, sharing information, and that's the currency of which trust is developed within. So real quick here, as I'm gonna to try to speed up a little bit, as we uh, talk about trust, it's really exciting. Technomics is a research organization in the food industry that has done quite a bit of uh, inf uh, research on the things that impact consumer trust. And you can see across the bottom, those big factors are, are human rights, labor, animal welfare, you can see health and wellness, food safety, occupational safety, environmental impact. Okay, those are the six key pillars that they've identified. The red ones are ones that are directly related to consumption. So animal welfare, for instance, as animal welfare uh, trust goes up, consumption directly goes up. From the environmental standpoint, there isn't a direct relationship, but as trust in the environmental efforts of our industry go up, okay, consumption tends to increase as well. And so what's important about here is I have some good information for as bad as it feels sometimes, consumers in all honesty are neutral in their level of trust that they have towards our industry. So that's good and bad. It means we're not behind the eight ball, but it also suggests we have a pretty significant opportunity to get to the point where they trust our industry more, okay? And the goal that they, they said there, if we could take those neutral trust scores that you see on the screen there and elevate them all to a four, we have the opportunity to increase consumption of meat by 13%. Meat consumption can increase with trust. We'll talk about that here in a minute. And we talked about uh, the role that producers play, and I think U.S. cattle trace is so important with the, the roots in production agriculture with farmers and ranchers because multiple data points suggest that, that consumers trust farmers and ranchers more than any other part of our supply chain. Okay, so the message is coming from the right place. The challenging part is, is that their expectations for animal welfare, specifically in this case, uh, aren't in their minds aren't being met. And even more so, they don't feel there's enough information. 40% of them don't feel there's enough information, you know, available to them with regards to animal welfare. And this is important because if you look to the, the yellow bars over there, there's a large population of individuals that are shaping not just the current consumption patterns, but their parents of children that are going to be our consumers long term and moving forward. And so this is a very important uh, point that I think offers some opportunity. Here's the big question. Will consumers be willing to pay for it? I think the reality is, is that a third of consumers would pay more for beef if we knew more about it's animal welfare information or how the cattle were handled. Okay, three out of 10 would not as they believe, and this is important, they believe it should be standard practice. But if we aren't providing them the information, how do they know it is standard practice? And so the, I, I highlighted this area, the value added opportunity here is that we may not see from consumers always the willingness to pay more pound or dollars per pound of our product that we produce, but the data supports that they would increase consumption. And that in and of itself is value added to, to uh, uh, disease traceability. From an environmental standpoint, uh, here relatively quickly, that same study looked at the, the trust levels on the environment. And this is exciting. 60% of consumers believe that beef can be done in an environmentally sustainable way. The challenging part is, is that only 45% believe that we're acting responsible today. So what does that say? It says they believe beef production can be done well, but they question our methodologies, whether that's technologies that we use, whatever it might be. And so we have an opportunity, I think, to, to share information that can uh, change or, or change that uh, understanding and that idea. You know, as I begin to kind of finish up here, I think it's important to note that this, this climate change discussion, and you'll hear from Sarah later, I'm sure she'll spend some time talking about this, it's not going away. 
Okay, and I guess it's going to be, a, I think, an opportunity for significant value added opportunities within our sector. Okay, it comes with a lot of turmoil at times and opinion and emotion, but I think there's a value added opportunity there as well. And I get the question, well, what makes what makes climate change and sustainability any different than other production claim programs out there, whether that be organic or, or antibiotic free or natural or grass fed? What makes them different? Because while those programs are growing, they haven't grown to the point where they've transitioned with an economic signal that has really changed our entire industry, have they? So what's different? Is, is sustainability gonna be just another production claim type program that remains fairly niche? And I think the answer is, is probably not. I think it's unlikely. And this is some information that uh, actually was shared at the Angus Convention last week. And it's unlikely because it's unlike organic and natural grass-fed, a large cross-section of the world has decided this climate change thing is important. Okay, that's a consuming base of consumers and, and, and customers that uh, uh, carry quite a big, uh, big economic opportunity. And while some consumers may value climate change, okay, most customers, those selling product to consumers probably will, and here's why, you know, in my opinion, you know, I do believe that, that uh, customers, end users, retailers, and so forth, they do want to do the right thing. I think that's part of it. But we also know that they're being influenced by shareholders and the investment community. Okay, there's, there's advantages in your sustainability platform to the cost and access of financing. And they've made these statements public. And they'll be held to, to showing continual improvement towards those sustainability and climate change goals. So this just gives you some idea in terms of uh, um, uh, what we're seeing, we're seeing uh, some companies make statements around being net zero for climate, some kind of carbon neutrality. You know, I guess where we're beginning to see these public goals begin to create uh, uh, activity within the production chain. Some of you might have been a part of it. Earlier this year, Walmart had uh, a survey uh, distributed to some of their supply chains asking about what's being done at the operational level with regards to environmental impact, um, animal care, uh, grazing management, and so forth. And so we're beginning to see some of that taking place. And so um, I think the point is when companies make these net zero climate commitments, it often involves the entire chain. So we're a part of this, whether or not we want to be or not. And I think it's good that we are. They cannot meet those goals that they have without environment involving every single one of us. And it's it's hard to connect those dots, but the reality is, is that everybody wants to take credit for the good things that are being done at the ranch level. And I think that presents an opportunity for us to understand what their needs are. And instead of waiting for them to come to us uh, with their needs, it gives us the opportunity to share our ideas on what uh, we can do to, to help them. There's resources available uh, through the sustainability goals of NCBA, but also uh, the U.S. Roundtable for Sustainable Beef has created some metrics that I think would be important to the production sector to incorporate into a vision for how we utilize the information in our production practices to uh, create more value to meet the needs of end users. So here's a little bit, a few questions I want to leave you with. You know, what's the opportunity to improve management? Does traceability offer producers? And that's really what Brian focused on in a big portion of his discussion. How can we utilize this stuff to get better ourselves? The second one is the very question I asked you before is what are you doing that could interest more people in your cabin? The third one there is what relevant information that's meaningful to end product customers and consumers can be collected? Do we need to be providing more information on grazing management plans or nutrient management plans? Or is there behavioral data that we can capture like we talked about that can help us in our uh, animal care uh, messaging to hopefully drive consumption? You know, what information are you willing to share? And then ultimately, I think it's what's the cost of taking a just wait and see attitude, which I think uh, many of you, uh, part of the reason you're here is because you don't like that cost, whether it's for this or animal disease traceability. The last thing I'll share, and this is my last slide, is, is uh, it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, oftentimes I hear a certified MSP that's the overnight success that took four, took four decades to build. Um, it was nine years from when the certified MSP program was started to when the first visible premium was ever paid to a producer for qualified cap. Now, I'm not saying anybody's got to wait nine years. Probably that's almost an unacceptable timeline today, but it doesn't happen overnight. It is about being in it for the long haul. And again, I appreciate your time. Thank you.
So again, we have opportunities um, to ask questions. John said earlier, if he was the guy who's going to ask the questions, not have to give the answers, that he was the perfect speaker. But now you get the chance to put him on the other side, ask your questions, and, and see what answers he has for you. Who has a question for John? John, one of the neat experiences I've had was able to go to Worcester. And I was really impressed with, probably the biggest thing I was impressed with what you guys do there is, is the analytics. And that room that was, you know, tied up fully just to kind of monitor the conversations and see what's going on. Can you, have you learned anything on, from traceability in that room on conversations that are pulling up? And if so, what was the big takeaway? Yeah, I think the biggest thing, the biggest takeaway uh, really goes back to the fact that consumers don't think about things near as segmented as we do in the industry. Okay, they, they like to lump stuff together. And traceability isn't really a conversation that a consumer has as a standalone topic. It really is about what can we, what do we know about this animal as a whole? Okay, it's, uh, it's kind of like when you, uh, this, is, this is a bad example, but I'm going to use it because it's top of mind. Okay, it's uh, you know it's like when you when I met my wife, it wasn't just about where is she from. Okay, so tell me about her parents. Do you know how is she raised? Okay, what what does she value? What about the people around her? What do they value? And honestly, this whole thing is about blending facts and emotion with consumers, and we see that very very evident in the data that we that we're privy to. And uh, so it really isn't about traceability. It's traceability as a vehicle to help answer this big pot of questions that consumers have. They just want, they want to just feel good about the decision they make to purchase our product. And traceability is a big part of that, but it's not, it's the information that we can transmit with it that really is what they're at. Additional questions for John. John, as we head into the small group sessions here in just a few minutes, I can head in your way, I'll ask a question in round. As we're headed into those small group sessions in just a few minutes, what advice do you have for this group in regards to really thinking about who we partner with? You asked the question of, of how um, who can cattle trace partner with, or how do we how do we bring in folks, or what does that look like to move from animal disease traceability, which is where those cattle trace will stay focused? What do those partnerships look like to you? And what advice do you have for us to be talking about that? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is it starts with understanding what their needs are. I think it's it's having conversations and asking the question, what do you need from us to be more successful with me? And that, that's really the conversation I think is extremely important. Um, once we know that, I think we find it all the time that we have things that are important to us. And it's oftentimes hard for us to put what's important to us off to the side to focus on what's important to the customer. And then afterwards to figure out how do we take what's important to the customer and weave our needs into that as well. That's what true pull through demand creation is. Tom, you mentioned several, <clears throat> excuse me, several times in your presentation about a connection to producers. Who are, who have you defined as your producers? Yeah, from a producer standpoint, it is, in all honesty, anybody who touches the live animal. It, it is the cattle feeder, it is the stocker operator, it is the seed stock supplier, and the cow calf producer. Uh, in all honesty, as we talk to end users and consumers, um, We'll put it this way, Mike, whenever you have to start answering the question with, well, it's complicated, okay? That makes it hard for the customer to trust you, okay? And so what we do is we talk about all of these folks are our producers, but they specialize in different things. But we try not to separate this segment from that segment to that segment, but rather these are all producers that just specialize in different aspects because it drives, it drives efficiency, it provides a safer, more affordable product for everybody down the road. That's kind of the approach that we take. John, during every time we start talking about traceability, I think, you know, we jump, and you, you just said it perfectly, that our industry is very segmented. And we go to the added value portion, and, and all of that is absolutely true. But with cattle, and I'm asking your opinion, but with, with U.S. cattle trace, we are laser focused on disease traceability. And, and try not to get into everybody's 
fitness and their programs and what they do. Basically, in my opinion, and, and I'm asking for if you agree or disagree, what we're really looking at here is, is how can, we're trying to develop a, a program, a national program, as an insurance policy for every one of those programs that you're talking about. Because the first disease outbreak that we have, those programs will make nothing. And as an as a industry as a whole, we don't have an insurance policy in a way to prove where our cattle have been, how we take care of our health, and how we stop a disease outbreak to protect the department. To me, as a producer, that is what I'm like to vote and spell as a board member, and what I think U.S. Cattle Trace is all about. Now, if you agree with that, first of all, do you agree with that? And second of all, how do we get the industry to understand that we've got to have an insurance policy for each? Sure. Well, I do agree with it. I think we only have to look maybe through the supply chain disruptions that we've seen through, through COVID to understand what those can do. And uh, trade COVID for a uh, disease outbreak of some sort, and you have probably similar uh, supply disruptions that again, wreak havoc on a market. And so I think your, your point, Joe, is well made uh, on that. You know, how do we how do we get beyond that? I think it is elevating the, the conversation to um, getting people comfortable with the idea that our customer is, uh, uh, they're willing to buy our product, but it's not the only product that's available to them. I think that's something that I think is important to share. We're, we're in a very enviable spot with beef, that folks love beef, okay? And But I think the idea that that oftentimes that we, have, we will always, and we're entitled to that position, that's what we begin to hear from consumers and end users, that the reality is there are so many other options, even among Adam and beef eaters, that there are so many other options. I think it's just trying to expose folks, you know, at the speed at which they're willing to, to take that information that the world is changing and the consumer is king ultimately. Uh, and uh, it's trying to just expose them, Joe, to that reality. If it was easy, this would all be done already. John, the, uh, when you talk about the, the consumer that, that wants that trust, they want to see that transparency. What, what are you seeing in the consumer data as far as what level of detail do they want to see? They don't want to see the, the 40 pictures that were taken of that effort she walked around the feed yard that day. But, you know, and, and so what level of detail makes them give that warm, fuzzy feeling of comfort? Yeah. Uh, how many of you have seen that episode of Portlandia on YouTube where they have the, the, the chicken conversation that its name was, I don't know, Anthony or whatever it might be? Couple of you had. If you haven't, look it up. It's funny, okay? But it talks about the level of detail that, uh, to an extreme, to an extreme sense, of consumers that want to know each and everything about the products and the needs that they consume. I think the reality is, is I think it's far less than what what we actually are led to believe. You know, we hear stories, and I hear see examples in some cases where we have a, a QR code that tells me right on the package. It tells me everything. That, that could possibly ever be known about that animal. And I think there are consumers that want that, but I don't think that's the core consumer. You know, in all honesty, what we find, probably less than the data and more just through experience and interaction, is they want to know that our value system aligns with their value system. And the minute we accomplish that and we justify it and support it with data, not just lip service, but support it with some data, that they trust us not only on that package, but the next 10 to 100 packages that they buy. And so I do think we have this halo effect that if once we establish trust, that it's not that we have to provide the serial number and social security number of everybody in the system, but they want to know that if they have questions, they have information that can answer. And I think what we're in, we're in an information age today. And, um, you know, you don't really realize how important that information is until you're in a position where it's not available when they're looking for it. Okay, so hopefully that answers your question. Any additional questions for John? Well, if not, again, he's provided us more to think about, so please join me in thanking John for his